Let's see. And now I'll go ahead and let's, I'll put this up here for you. So what happens is this. I got this vertical realm and I got this horizontal realm. And so in the horizontal realm, God says, you're a creature, the first relationship. You have an obligation to those other people who are living around you. I want you to love them and care for them and meet their needs. That's my obligation. And so I start paying attention to what they need and thinking about their needs, and I try to help them. And I do that. What gives me direction in that? The law. God's will. The curb. Helps me figure out what I should be doing. But I don't do it so well. I make mistakes. I fail. So my conscience begins to convict me because the law always accuses. And the law bites me and helps me realize, ah, I didn't do it the way I should. I failed. And so then I come in God's presence. And when I'm in God's presence, he says, how are you doing? How are you doing with this keeping of the law? Not very well. In fact, I don't have much to offer here at all. No good things. I'm in bad shape. And God says, you're in worse shape than you realize. You haven't even come close, and I'm dead. The law kills me. And then the gospel of Christ makes me alive and gives me forgiveness, raises me up, makes me alive again. Having been made alive and having this wonderful gospel message from God, now what? Well, God turns around and sends me right back out into the world, into my relationships where I was there working before. I'm not set free from those responsibilities, but I am turned loose back into those relationships that tells me what I need to be doing, and I go do them. I do them not thinking that somehow my performance solidifies my standing before God. That's a different issue altogether. I do them simply because that's what Christians do. The indicative, it simply describes what I do, and the imperative because my neighbor needs them. And, yeah, God wants me to do them. Do I earn brownie points with God by doing them? No. I get more saved? No. I'm simply doing what God has called me to do. And so you live in this continual pattern. And so I'm out here doing my thing. How do I perform? Well, not always very well. And so I'm driven my, back to God again to hear the word of forgiveness one more time. And it's an ongoing thing. And so the second use of the law as mirror, is that a one-time thing? No. Daily. Hourly. Minute by minute. I realize my need for God's forgiveness again and again and again. And the law is one of these things that just when you think you got it under control, that's when it's going to get you and it bites you. And that's why Kolb likes to call it a domesticated wolf. You know, you think you've got it under control, and just when you're getting a little comfortable with it, it turns and snaps and takes off your hand. And you're in trouble again. So you just you think you're getting it figured out. You're really doing well in your life. And then that's when it happens. You stumble. You fall flat. And, man, what a mess. And there you are, back before God, empty pockets, begging for forgiveness. And see, the other thing is this. In the realm before God, it's all about the gospel. But out here in the world, in this civil realm, in the realm where I live day to day, it's all about the law. And the gospel really doesn't apply out here. The law calls the shots. The law tells me what's expected and what I need to do. The good will of God. And I pay attention to it. And I take seriously what I'm called to do and work hard at these things. <clears throat> the other thing you realize is that when you go before God then, you could have a tremendous amount of righteousness out here in the civil realm have a great level of righteousness and good works to your credit and all kinds of things that are right on track, lots of good works. But what standing do those have before God? None. None. Worse, they're actually detrimental. Because in the civil realm, so I'm a good husband. Great. I'm a good dad. Wonderful. My kids love me. I'm a good neighbor. I mow my neighbor's lawn. I rake her gumballs. And if you're not from St. Louis, you haven't learned about gumballs yet. You can look forward to that. And so you take care of the things you need to do, and you're a great guy. And everybody says, he's the greatest guy. He's wonderful. And so now I go waltzing into God's presence and say, God, here comes the great guy. Man, have I got the good deeds wrapped up. And what kind of reception do I get from God? 
Yeah, not a happy one. In fact, he says, what is this stinking pile of junk I smell in here? Oh, those are your good works. <laughs> Pretty foul. Because you see, everything I consider a good work, what even other people might consider a good work, in God's presence never measures up because it's polluted with sin. This is the secret of Isaiah when he says, all of our righteous acts are as filthy rags. See, Isaiah is not talking about fake attempts at good works. He's talking about real, genuine good works that people in the world would say, oh, that's great. Good job. And he says, those are filthy rags because you bring those before me and you try to earn credit with God with those things, and that's offensive. God is not pleased. He rejects them. No use for them. Kind of confused because one thing, I don't know, this I heard straight from Concordia system stuff, that the, we obviously do good works as a guide out of responsible of the law, but that it brings glory to God. <coughs> How do you fit that in with what you're it, saying or yeah. not fit it in? Yeah, I would say it brings glory to God because I'm doing what God has given me to do. Just like the duck brings glory to God when he flies south for the summer or for the, for the winter, okay? Sure. And just like the rock brings glory to God when it lies in the sun and gets warm when it's sunny and gets cold when it's cold. He's honoring God. It's so, good so are good we rock. So still bring glory to God and he cele celebrates in that boat. To an extent. You see now, see this, this, because this gets interesting here. So, I'm doing all these good things, and I'm a great guy. Right, living right next to me is a good Mormon. And Mormons are good. They've got to be, because they're trying to go to heaven. And so he, he's a good guy. In fact, would you like to have a Mormon for a neighbor? I'll take him. He's going to mow his lawn when he should. He'll probably be happy to take care of my garbage can for me when I'm on vacation. He'll probably look after things for me. I mean, do I have to worry about him breaking into my house and stealing stuff? No, no. I mean, he's going to be a great neighbor, good guy. And I can have wild parties, you know, I don't have to worry about him getting drunk and messing up things. He's going to be a good guy. I'll take it. So he's got, he's got all kinds of righteousness in the eyes of the world, lots of it. Is he leading a God-pleasing life? In one sense, yes. In one sense. Because what's he doing? He's obeying the law, Right? He's conforming himself to the will of God. This is a good thing. God-pleasing. Is it salvific? Not at all. In other words, does he earn salvation by what he's doing? No way. In fact, the more he piles up his good works, probably the more deluded he becomes into thinking he's right on track and really doing great, and then the bigger problem he's got. Because now when he walks into God's presence with his pockets bulging with all of his good works and his backpack overflowing with all of his good works and he dumps them in front of God and watches them all turn into, you know, pick your noun. And then he's in serious trouble because God is offended by that. And who's brought this pile of junk in before me? And the curse comes. You see, that's the thing. It's two different worlds. Right. Civil, civil, in a civil realm... Righteousness out the ears. Is it God-pleasing to be civilly righteous? Sure. So, multimillionaire gives a few million dollars to build a hospital. Is that a good thing? God-pleasing? Yeah, in a sense. God wants his world cared for. He wants hospitals built. This is a good thing. But is God going to give him salvation because of this? Absolutely not. Because salvation is always the same thing. It's always about grace. Always, always, always about grace. Never performance. Okay? Go ahead. So, before you said the guiding part, only Christians yeah. can do that. Right. But in some sense, you, you, know, you know, there's kind of like an overlap there. Yeah, what you stumbled on is part of my, yeah. Okay? What you stumbled on is what I wasn't going to give you today. I'm going to wait until you took those in mind, but you've given, forced me. All right? <laughs> Force my hand. In fact, what we have going here is, in a sense, almost three kinds of righteousness. Because we have a righteousness before God, which is all about God killing me and making me alive and about the gospel. And we have a righteousness before the world, which is simply conforming to the law, whether I know it or not. So the philanthropist who gives millions of dollars and the Mormon who's being nice. Righteousness? You bet. Lots of it. But then we have another kind of righteousness, what I would call a third kind of righteousness, which is the Christian, simply doing the things that God has given him to do. 
The difference between this righteousness of the Christian and the righteousness of the Mormon, on the outside, what's the difference? Negligible. The guy living down the street looking at my Mormon neighbor and me, probably tell a little difference, except probably the Mormon's a little better. All right? He can't see any difference. The Mormon smiles more. I get crabby. Okay? <laughs> and so he can't tell any difference at all. He doesn't see any difference. But in fact, there's a world of difference. The world of difference is I'm justified because I know where I stand before Christ. And I have something the, Christ, the Mormon doesn't. I have the freedom of going to bed at night knowing where I stand with God, never having to wonder, never having to doubt. Because no matter how hard I knock myself out in any given day, and no matter how bad I fail in any given day, still God's forgiven child never changes. And the Mormon never has that assurance. Because what he has done is he has confused this righteousness with this righteousness. And he thinks that somehow his good job will earn him good standing before God. He's in big trouble. But in reality, these are both righteousnesses out there in the world. And they look a lot the same. And don't we sometimes do the, the lowest, the lower of those lines? Well, sure. See, that's what that's, that's, that's sometimes I'm saying. Sometimes the curb just motivates me. And really, that's the bottom line. That's the bottom line, sure. I'm doing stuff sometimes simply because I need to, I have to, it looks good, I like the praise. Am I always doing everything out of my pure love for Jesus? No. But see, here's the other thing. What makes a good work a good work? Some of you guys remember this from your Concordia system classes. Who can do a good work? Only a Christian. Non-Christians can't do good works because we're defining good work very narrowly as only what's being done in Christ is acceptable to God. That's true. But you see, what makes the good work acceptable to God is not the fact that you're doing it so right or you have the right attitude. Your right attitude, your motivation has nothing to do with whether or not it's a good work. It becomes a good work for only one reason, simply because it's forgiven. Because even that good work gets the grace of Christ. And so God says, you've done it in Christ. I'll forgive the sin. Acceptable now. See, we have made a big mistake as Christians. We get so hung up on motivation. Why am I doing this? Is it for the right reason? Am I doing it out of love of God? Am I doing it because of the gospel? Or am I doing it because of the law? Who cares? Who cares? I'm just getting all hung up on motivation. Just do what God's called you to do. Rejoice in the forgiveness that you have. And be grateful that he receives all of your works as good works because they're done in Christ. That's the beauty of the Christian life. You see, this is also then where we can stick in, even though I think Cole might save it for later, this is also where we can stick in the simul justus epicator. 